Twitter, please. Uh, this is a meeting of the uh, Finance Advisory Committee of uh, on September 9th, 2013 at 7.06. Uh, call the meeting to order and ask Gail to please call the roll. Here. So let's start with the, with the minutes. Um, uh, we, we had posted one set and then we sent around amended minutes today. So it's the amended, or the revised, I guess, not amended. Um, uh, so hopefully everybody saw them. If not, we have uh, copies. They were emailed to the group. So here's a good start. They were all emailed to the to everybody's OPRF um, uh, email address. So you either have to check it or get it. Get it. Uh, we can help you get it onto your phone if you want, into Exchange Server. So yep. um, we can do that. do it that way. So I just forgot this it was a different account. Yeah, this is a, this is a good test. <laughs> I already moved it. Why don't you send it? sorts of, of um, input about impacts on the community. Uh, as I've been listening through all of you in the meetings and, and in some one-on-ones and just sensing where we were, um, uh, it, it started to feel important that we, that we shift a little bit to starting to talk about how we're actually going to uh, uh, answer the questions that are before us as a committee. So that combined with the fact that it was the end of the summer and um, some time constraints with getting some other presentations done, uh, we decided, I decided, I guess, um, uh, that uh, we would invite Ali uh, El Safar tonight to do a, a, a big chunk of the presentation on the community impact. Uh, and uh, then um, Todd will uh, provide some feedback on some of the questions we had coming out of last uh, meeting. And then I'm going to provide some reflections and some framing on what I've heard from everybody and how I think we can, we can move forward from here. Uh, the, the community impact conversations are still very much on the table, uh, and I'll talk about that some when I talk about next steps and stuff. So that's just sort of the setting for where we are. Um, out of here, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, and with that, I'd uh, uh, like to welcome Ali El Safar, the Oak Park Township Assessor, right? Is that the, um, uh, who has graciously agreed to uh, talk about local real estate taxes and the impact uh, that they have on, on our community uh, and provided some context and I'll just hand over to Ali. Okay. Are, are we waiting for somebody to come up? 
Um, you know, we have a couple more committee members who will arrive, but we'll just go ahead and, and, uh, and get Okay, I'll, I'll just they'll come in. So you're on. You're on. presentation, I have tried to, tell me if this is not working, I might just talk on the phone on these things. I tried to include as much of a forest information as I could, because I know Oak Park and Forest High School encompasses both communities. I grew up in Rip Forest. I'm a proud graduate of OPRF. And I remember the first time I made a presentation here. You know the big blue letters behind the building that the Oak Park and Forest High School? That was my class, yeah. And to present it, I brought a big L to the school board to show them what they were doing. <laughs> so. so anyway. Um, I've been the township assessor since 2001, and uh, in that time, I've, you know, my alma mater has been in the news a lot, so I've been working with uh, tax related issues since then. Um, first, I want to start out with something that I suspect everybody in this room probably knows about, but it reflects a common misconception about property taxes that just needs to go. This is a quote that appeared in the, uh, in the Wednesday Journal in 2009 when property values had gone down a lot talking about how local boards have counted on ever-increasing real estate revenues. With every three-year real, real estate reassessment, more tax dollars poured in. That geyser is slowing because of decreasing home values, and it'll lead to lower tax bills for homeowners. Hooray! That's the exact quote. And less tax revenue for local boards. So, true or false? Did this person make a true or an accurate or inaccurate statement uh, in the Wednesday Journal in 2009? Very inaccurate. Okay. <laughs> but it is a very common misconception that when property values go up, tax bills go up. When property values go down, tax bills go down. It's the single most common question I hear uh, in my office. And, and really, there are reasons why people think that. Because if you look at the basic formulas for collecting taxes, um, income taxes, well, guess what? If your income goes up, your income tax goes up. The sales taxes, if you buy more stuff, you pay more sales tax. Real estate transfer tax, you buy more expensive homes, you pay more transfer tax. And it would be easy to think that the same is true with property taxes, but it's often not the case. And the reason is that in the realm of income tax and sales tax and real estate tax, the rates are fixed. They're fixed by the legislature or the village board or whoever the case may be. Um, and therefore, if you've got a booming economy and a fixed rate, well, a lot of people are earning more money, you got more income tax rates through the government. Uh, people are buying more things, you got more sales tax revenue. Uh, people buy more houses, you got more real estate transfer tax revenue, but not the case of property taxes. In property taxes, unlike the other three types of taxation, the rate is not fixed, the rate is flexible, it goes up and down. Uh, the main goal in real estate taxes is to raise a specific amount of money. Um, and as values are going up, the rate's going to adjust to accommodate for that. If values are going down, the rate's going to adjust as well. Um, so I have proposed, uh, instead of, uh, you know, to think of property taxes in a different way, I call it the tax tab. And I usually draw an analogy to familiar with a lot of people's experience, a night out in a bar with a group of friends. A lot of people will go out, run up a tab, right? And at the end of the night, if you're the bar owner, you don't care how much David and Bob pay, right? The bar owner cares about the total tab that it gets paid, without being really worried about uh, you know, the individual person. One person might pay the whole thing, it might be divided up, it doesn't really matter to the bar, as long as the bill gets paid. And we have something very similar, if I, to analogize local governments to a, a bar owner, uh, we have something very similar in property taxes. That is, we have what I call a tax tab, okay? Last year at Oak Park, for example, the tab was $170 million. That means all the property owners combined in Oak Park paid $170 million. And from the point of view of local government, they're not necessarily that concerned with you know, how much person A paid, how much person B paid. The concern from the point of view of government is, am I going to collect that money? And that's what the property tax system is designed to do, to collect a predetermined amount of money. And River Forest, last year's tax tab was $54 million. Again, the same thing. All the River Forest property owners collectively paid $54 million last year. And by the way, as I'm talking, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I mean, this is. I can talk if you want to hear me drone on, but if you have a question, I think it makes it more interesting uh, interplay. Um, so that money goes to all the local taxing government, taxing districts, um, and in Oak Park, 65% of the money that gets collected goes 
for education. And River Forest, that amount is 73%. Um, so the tax that when I, when I come up with that number, what I'm really doing is I'm combining the tax levy of all local governments within each community. Um, and it directly influences how much everybody pays. If that tax tab is up 10%, the community as a whole is going to pay 10% more in property tax. So direct correlation between that number and how much you pay. Now each property pays just a tiny share of the tax tab. I once calculated that my house is eight, one thousand of one percent. That's that's the Elsevier portion of the tab. Um, and you could all do it. You could all figure out uh, what your share is if you're so inclined. Um, now all the things that my office deals with, we deal with tax appeals, tax exemptions, what the state legislature did with in terms of tax policy. That can change one person's share of the tax tab, but not the tab itself. So for example, suppose I did a great appeal, and I went from eight one thousandths of one percent to four one thousandths of one percent. Now for me, that's a big deal. I'd be cutting my tax bill in half. But that's not going to cut the local government's revenue. Because what's going to happen is every other property owner in Oak Park is going to end up paying a little bit more to make up for my break. Um, I hear a lot of times people will say, oh, the government's not going to give us a tax reduction because they don't want to lose money. That, that's a very common statement I hear about. But it's a misconception. It doesn't actually happen. Okay, so this is the tax tab this year in Oak Park. Um, it's uh, $170 million. Um, and it is actually, you know, every year I do this. I've been doing this for 12 or 13 years, putting these figures together, because I think they're helpful and interesting. When people start, people will often come to my office and complain about taxes, and this is where I start. I start talking about how much the total local government cost, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So I break it down by taxing district every year, and I've been doing this for 12 or 13 years. Usually I do it year to year, because it gives you an idea of where things are. Now I'll tell you that this year, the levy growth in Oak Park 1.18% is the lowest levy growth since I've been keeping track of this figure, um, which is 12 or 13 years. And that probably explains why it was such a quiet year in my office. Um, when that number is higher, it's a lot more exciting in the Oak Park Township Assessor's Office, I can tell you. Uh, and if you look at these numbers, I think they're sort of interesting, um, especially the second number, the high school board. The high school board, uh, this is the first time really, I think that I recall, where I've seen a taxing district actually reduce its tax levy. Um, and uh, in Oak Park, anyway. You see, if you look at some of the other ones, that, that Trite College, for example, lowered its levy by about 7%, but that's, that's not as local. The high school board's decision to lower its levy has a real impact because it's 28% you know, of the tax bill. So uh, that's a big part of the reason why we see this relatively low uh, increase in the tax levy this year. And it's also a big part of the reason why my office Um, and as I say, I've been keeping track of these numbers for a long time, and we're going to get back and look at these numbers a little bit later. But every year, the tax levy has been, been going up by a fairly significant amount. Um, and sometimes it's, it's worthwhile. We're going to look at a, a different graph in that in just a minute. That sort of gives you an idea. We started out, my first th year, when I, just after, before I took office, it was $88 million an hour and $170 million. It's still part. In a forest. I'll yes, I'll go ahead. Pause for a second to tell people, because we've got to say, Holly's actually got some printouts of, of this uh, yes, uh, here. I'm um, not sure we have one for everybody, but if anybody wants one to take notes on, we can do that now, but just know also that at the end, we, we do have them available, so they'll, they'll take all the notes with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're not all going to memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, then the River Forest Tax Tab. We have a similar story in River Forest, where there's a very small increase this year. Uh, almost 0.17% increase. Again, what's the reason? Well, two reasons. First of all, of course, the high school levy will affect uh, the forest as well as the park. Uh, and when the high school levy went down, that will have an impact on the overall levy of the forest. In addition to which, uh, School District 97 uh, chose not to, sorry, School District 90, I went to School District 90, yeah. um, and 90 chose not to increase its levy this year. And so when you have the two largest entities that is the two school districts, choosing basically no increase or even a decline in their levy, that's going to have a pretty significant impact on the overall uh, tax tab for River Forest. So I, I wasn't in the River Forest Assessor's Office, but I suspect that they were even quieter than my office this year. 
Um, and again, we, we can go through this, this tax stamp history in a second, but I, I, I calculated this uh, somewhat from this presentation, I guess. One thing that you might ask, I'm just going to go real quickly, how, is this, how do I divide this between Oak Park and River Forest? The way it's done, uh, you basically take the EAV, the equalized assessment in Oak Park, divided by the high school EAV. Do the same thing for River Forest, and you get this kind of number here. Uh, and this is just sort of a little bit interesting. It changes a little bit every year. You can see that Oak Park is about three fourths of the, uh, the tax levy for the high school, and River Forest about a quarter. That's changed. River Forest has creeped up a little bit in the last couple of years. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, that's right. I only got ten, so share with your neighbor. Um, yeah, well, we'll get you more. I, just, I uh, didn't have enough. To show. And if anybody in the, in the vast audience out there wants a copy, let me know. I Every year, these percentages change a little bit. All right, so the main question that people ask is, how did that tab go up? Um, and it's really a question of state law. The, 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 the state legislature passes the rules and makes the rules to determine how each local taxing district can operate. Um, so most taxing districts can increase their levies by no more than the rate of inflation. That's the general rule. Um, it's got a fancy name, the Property Tax Extension Limitation Law, PTEL, they like to say it, but I just prefer to call it tax gap because that's a lot easier to understand. Now, if, as soon as I say that, I, I, I anticipate an objection. Uh, and the objection may be from a local taxpayer who might wonder if the state law allows us to increase levies by the rate of inflation, what's happened to my bill? Because most people in Oak Park and River Forest, their, their, their taxes are going to buy a lot more than the rate of inflation. And I have a little graph that I show to folks um, when they ask this kind of question. And sometimes the graph, the reason I've got this angry face is this graph makes people mad. It's made people mad in my office. I, tr I try to calm people down, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, so I'm calling it the anger-inducing tax tab growth here. Um, and as I say, it makes some folks mad. This has got two different numbers we're comparing. The rate of inflation in the United States since 1999 and the rate of levy growth in Oak Park tax levies during the same time period. And you can see a rather dramatic difference between those two numbers. Um, the uh, the inflation has been around 37%, I think is the number, um, since 1999 to 2012, uh, whereas the levy growth in Oak Park is in excess of 90% during that same period. And we're going to talk about how all that happened, and there are reasons why it happened. But when you have a law that says you can only increase your levy by the rate of inflation, there's that big of a gap. You know, if, if nothing else, I have this graph because it helps people understand what's going on. Because a lot of people will come into my office, they're upset, they don't really know why. I like to give them a lot of facts. I don't usually give them little you know, yellow, yellow guys getting mad. But this sort of, I do hear that back from folks. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to understand that. Um, we have something similar going on in River Forest. Uh, I'm sure that we have yellow angry guys there too. It's a similar kind of graph where the, the increase is in, in excess of 90% in the levies over the last uh, several years. Okay, so as we were saying before, the taxing districts can increase their levies by no more than the rate of inflation, but there are lots of exceptions to that rule. Um, and we're gonna, we have to need to know about those exceptions if we're really going to understand what's been going on with taxes in the last decade or so. Um, so, we know our general rule, tax levies cannot rise by more than the rate of inflation unless we have a series of uh, different things. Uh, there's one exception to that is if you're the government of the village of Oak Park. Um, second unless is that's because they're a home rule unit. Not we're going to get to that. That's okay. coming up. There's a successful referendum, and there's new growth and or the expiration of the tip petition. Those are the three main reasons why 
who can have tax levies that increase the rate of inflation. And let's go start with what, what Bob was just trying to say. You're the government of the Village of Oak Park. The Village of Oak Park is a home rule community. Um, and home rule communities are simply not subject to that fancy property tax extension limitation law. That's, they're, not, they're not subject to that. And that is a law that limit, limits levy increase in the rate of inflation. It's important since we're OPRF to say that River Forest is not home rule. They had a referendum which was not passed a couple of years ago to make it home rule. And therefore, the government of the village of River Forest is subject to tax caps. Now, this doesn't mean that if you're a home rule community, you increase taxes willy nilly. It just means the, the check, if you will, is more often political pressures or other pressures than just a legal you know, law that says you simply cannot do that. In fact, there are a lot of, if you think of home rule communities like the city of Chicago or the uh, Cook County Board, for example, those home rule entities actually tend to increase their levies by less than some of the other ones. So that's, it's, uh, but nonetheless, it's important to realize that uh, all these uh, rules we're going to talk about, about referendums and everything, do not apply to those in part in terms of tax. Okay, so the second reason why you can get increases in taxes that exceed the uh, rate of inflation is as a successful referendum. Now, this, this is something that we've seen a lot in Oak Park. And I, I want to just go, to go through it because one of the main issues, I think the reason we're here ultimately is because of a referendum here at the high school that was passed in 2002. So I want to sort of give you a little bit of background on how referendums uh, are supposed to work and what happened here at the school. Uh, the way they're supposed to work can be seen in Oak Park School District 97, which had a referendum in 2011. Before that referendum and after that le referendum, its levy increases were about at the rate of inflation. Um, except for one year. This is the 10 taxes that were paid in 11. If you look at it where it says referendum in red, you can see in 2009 the increase was you know, tiny, less than 1%. 11 and 12, it was 2%. But in 2010 taxes paid in 11, it was nearly 15%. Now that was permissible because a referendum was approved by the voters. That's according to state law. You get a referendum, you get voter approval, you can increase your levy by more than the rate of inflation. That's what District 97 did. Um, now, one thing to know that people often sometimes get confused about is once you've got your referendum, okay, then you go back, in, in this circumstance, to getting your ordinary inflation level increases. But the inflation level increases are over what? Over the new levy resulting from the referendum. So, for example, in 2010, you can see the levy after the referendum was 56 million. Uh, in 11, it was 57 million. So they got a 2% increase on that higher number. So once you get a referendum, that will always be in your levy under the state law. Okay. Um, School District 90 in River Forest put on a, a tax increase referendum in 2006. Now, I'm, this he heading here is referendum multi year they did it a little bit differently than when the way 97 did it. Um, under the District 90 referendum in, in River Forest, the levy increases were phased in over a four-year period. So you see in 2003 and 2004, you had a small increase, less than 2%, again, due to uh, increases um, just due to inflation. But in tax years 5, 6, 7, and 8, you had double-digit increases in each year. Um, and then in the final year, 2009, once we're done with that, we're back to the very small, you know, relatively small increases due to inflation. And that's um, so those are sort of two models, the way things are ordinarily done with referendums. Now let's talk about the high school referendum from 2002. Uh, and that year, the high school put a referendum on the ballot. And the goal is, is was quoted in the Wednesday Journal, it, it is uh, if it passes the district's annual budget was supposed to increase by about $6.5 million. This is something I was sort of involved in, in, in that, and that's the number everybody was talking about at the time, 6.5 million. So if we look at what actually happened, is, you know, even if, one of the things that's not commonly understood, but I think that people in this room probably do, even if your referendum fails, you can increase your levy just by not as much. So had the referendum failed in, in, in 2002 at the high school, for the 01 taxes paid in 02, there would have been an increase of around 5%. Why? Because even with an unsuccessful referendum, you can get um, greater levies due to inflation. Uh, in addition to which, there was a lot of new growth that year, and we can talk about that in a second. Um, so the increase would have been around 5% with an unsuccessful referendum. 
with a successful referendum, it was about 30%. And if you do a calculation, you compare uh, what was actually received, which was around 35 million, with what, which where they would have been had it failed, which is 28 million. The difference is 6.8 million. Lo and behold, that's awfully close to 6.5 million that everyone was talking about. Um, so the point being, from what I understood, and what I think most people who follow this understood at the time, was that the school advertised we were going to get six and a half million, and they got about six and a half million dollars. Story over. Just like it was with District 97 when it passed its referendum. A one year blip in terms of higher revenues, and then we're done from here on out. Didn't work out that way, though. Um, because, uh, unless you want me to tell you, explain it, I, I, I won't unless you want me to know. There's a, I'll just call it a court in state law. Uh, the school subsequently discovered it could phase in levy increases of more than six and a half million, very similar to the way it was done in reforms with school districts 200 students, school district 90. So, and, and it, it took a while, you know, I was talking to Cheryl Witham about this as I was putting numbers together earlier this year, um, just to sort of make sure we were on the same page about this, because I think there was a time the school wasn't really aware it was receiving extra money, um, but the way it was done at the county clerk's office it was actually getting extra money. Um, so yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, Ollie, yes. Um, uh, how about if you explain that quirk? The quirk? Yeah, because I'd like to, you, you're, you're very fast on at this, so I think you probably, uh, you might be able to um, uh, explain the quirk more clearly than. Okay, quirk explanation without benefit of PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the high school board was asking for a maximum rate of $2.95, 2.95% from the voters. That is one of the, the quirks I have, essentially about state law is when you want a referendum, you can't ask for an additional $6.5 million. That would be really easy. That, that would, that would, we wouldn't have had this problem if the law stated. That would be clear. Yes, you want $6.5 <laughs> million, you get it. Doesn't work that way. Instead, you have to determine a rate, okay? A maximum rate. State law then, and I think now, says that you know the education fund is what the high school was looking for. Prior to the referendum, the maximum rate was, uh, I think it was 230. And so they asked the voters for permission to increase the rate to 295. That's a 65 cent increase. Um, and the way we came up with the $6.5 million was relatively straightforward. At the time, the high school had an EAV, equalized assessed value, of about a billion. And if you multiply that by 0.65%, you get 6.5 million. And so what the law requires school districts to do is, you know, to make an educated guess. Because the problem with tax rates is they vary for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with the school district. Um, so the school is thinking, well, if we get 295, we're probably going to get $6.5 million, and that's only one. So let's ask for 295. And that was a completely reasonable decision that they made back in, uh, in 2001 when they made it. Well, what happened is, so you know, they added six and a half million dollars to their levy, and then the Cook County clerk calculated the tax rate, and guess what? It didn't quite get to 295. Maybe it was 279, something like that. It's not quite there, because the rate gets calculated after you ask for the levy. So, the school board had the right to go up to 295. It tried to get to 295, but because of you know things not related to the school, it didn't quite get there. It got to 279. Okay. This was the 01 taxes paid in 02. Now the state law at the time said if you don't reach 295, you know if you don't reach that magic level of 295, you can do it over a period of years, much like District 94. Well, sort of inadvertently, the high school didn't reach 295 but didn't get there. Well, what happened after that? What happened after that was we were in the housing boom. 2002 was a reassessment year, as I, as I well remember, um, because in 2002, the average increase in assessed values for homeowners in Oak Park was 46%. I remember we had, I had t-shirts that said, I survived a 46% increase. It was a huge increase, and because of that misconception, people thought, oh my God, my taxes are going 46%, I gotta move. I mean, we got tons and tons of calls. People with that kind of but as I said before, when you, um, 
It doesn't work that way. No school district got 46% more revenue. Um, no tax, um, most taxpayers didn't pay 46% more. Uh, instead, what happened was tax rate adjustment. So we had much higher values, but we were asking for more or less the same amount of money. Um, and so what happened? The tax rate went down. Whereas the education fund, which we were trying to get up to 295, and we only got to 279, it plummeted to like 179 or something like that. Okay. That is, when values are up, to raise the same amount of money, you need a, a lower tax rate. And as I said earlier on, the tax rate is flexible in the property tax system. Um, and this is where the issue went, because even though, you know, I don't think anybody really intended it this way, now, from the point of view, after the reassessment in 2002, the high school could look at what's going on and say, okay, our maximum rate is 295, but now we're only at 179. Right? We're well below the maximum rate. Um, and so at some point, now I don't know if this is making sense to you or not. I, I, this, okay, so at some point, they were like, hey, we could get a lot more money. Um, before we get to 295, we could get millions and millions more, and that's exactly what happened. In fact, I remember they never did get to the full 295 because of the reassessments and the reductions in the rate, um, they only had four years to get up to that level, and they didn't ever quite get up to it. Um, you know, there was some talk around this board table in 2005 that we're leaving money on the table, and what they meant by that is we're not getting the full amount of money we could get if we had really increased the 295. Nonetheless, they had, so uh, that's, that's basically the quirk in state law. There's a key, the quirk is that, the quirky part is tax rates. Tax rate change for, I mean, the reassessment really had nothing to do with the referendum or with the high school, but nonetheless, it affected the tax rate for the high school. And because of the way the law was written, there was a lot of room after the reassessment in 2002 to uh, generate more money. So the 02 reassessment combined with the referendum led people to believe that there was causation when otherwise it's simply association. Is that sort of It seems that the, the way that the referendum in 02 coincided with the uh, reassessment, coinciding with the um, property uh, value boom in the early part of the last decade, is that you had a set of circumstances where people were drawing conclusions when there was not, in fact, causation. It was more because there was an association in time. Well, there wasn't. So I would say wouldn't say causation. If I'm getting what you're saying, the what it left was this, it gave the school board a choice. There was no mandate that with this. Uh, Certainly it gave the school board here at the high school the ability to levy more money than was ever anticipated at the original referendum. Um, but it didn't cause it. it just, I mean, the, the reassessment. It was an opportunity. It was an opportunity. Okay. Uh, and the school board chose to take that opportunity. But it was not, it didn't have to be not at all. So. But nonetheless, you're absolutely right that the confluence of those two events that are really completely separate uh, is what gave rise to this. Uh, just as an aside, there is a movement. To, things have completely reversed now. Uh, there have been school districts, yeah, I don't think I want to get that. Completely, completely there is an effort in the legislature to, to, to try to change the law so that you ask for the amount of money you want, which I think would be awfully wise. Um, and, and Senator Harmon from Oak Park sponsored that bill um, in part because of what happened at the school, but it's, it's going in the reverse for other school districts around the state right now. So the idea of, of asking for rates is, is a foolish idea, I think. Um, but nonetheless, that's a lot. capped levy, is that the actual amount received? <laughs> no. Um, there are two, the levies in, most taxing districts have two types of levies. One is that that is subject to the tax caps that we talked about before, and that's what's shown here. The second one is for capital projects, borrowing, that sort of thing. Um, and those types of things are generally separate from the tax cap uh, and outside it. So the high school in 2002 was asking for a referendum to increase basically its cap levy portion. Um, and so that's what I was talking about there. But that's actual cash received. Well, and the other thing is, <laughs> this is something we often talk about. 
The levy is the number that determines your tax rate and your tax bill. Now, I think about 98, in Oak Park, 98, 99% of the amount that's levied actually gets collected. So it's not a 100% thing. There, there's, there's refunds at issue, there's properties that are not collectible and that sort of thing that, that lower a little bit. In other communities that have more problems than Oak Park in terms of valuation, the, the bigger number is a little bit bigger, I think. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit difficult. But the, the, there's so many variables in terms of actual amounts collected. Uh, in general, it's about the same, like the one or two percent loss every year in terms of the actual amount collected. But the reason I use cap levy or levies in general is because that's what drives the bill. And in, in my job and in, in my focus is people's bill. So if you're, if the school's levy is 30 or 50 or whatever money, that's going to determine, directly determine what your bill is. Now the fact the school might not collect it, that's a different story. That's an issue for the school, but not so much for the the, uh, <coughs> on the multi-year thing, I think I pointed it out before, is the law has changed and the wording on the ballot is radically different if you want to do a multi-year and it has to be very intentional, it can't be accidental. And that was a law change in 2005, 2006, somewhere in there. Yes. Yeah, that changed and then, I think they, they was, we still haven't had the changes I'd really like to see is just ask around which money you want. Forget this game. But <laughs> so I have a quick question. Yeah. You said um, that schools uh, didn't realize that it was getting extra money, but that's meaningful dollars difference from year to year. Well, you know, it's funny because Cheryl and I had a long conversation about 2004 in particular um, because, uh, and I'm trying to think what she told me, what her understanding was about it. I think there was some capital project that was going on, and I think she, she might have assumed that it was, I mean, she was surprised by these numbers. The, in, in the, on the unrecognized phase in those three years um, between the two and red that I'm talking about, I don't think she was necessarily surprised by two or three, but four kind of surprised her. That was, that was fairly sizable. Um, and uh, uh, what I, the reason I use it that way is because the big meeting was here in this room in December of 2005, um, when, and that's really when I think most of us became aware of this being an issue. And of course it is one of the, I think one of the largest increases took effect. The school board had to decide, you know, this is our last year, are we gonna, are we, there's some money on the table, are we gonna take some of it or all, but are we gonna use the opportunity, as, as Peter referred to it. Um, and I don't know that there was necessarily, in the prior years I'm not sure. But one of the things that happened, every district in, or almost every district in Oak Park course does what's called a balloon levy. That is, you never know because of the complexities of the law how much money you're actually going to get when you, when you pass a levy. So most districts say, well, well I don't know what I'm going to get, but I'm going to ask for more um, than I think I can get because the Cook County clerk by law will reduce it anyway. So I, but if I don't ask for enough, I lost it. And so uh, a lot of districts tend to ask for more than they think they can get. If they didn't realize about this, this phase-in thing that they had, that they actually got more than they probably thought they were going to get. Um, I think this is, uh, I don't know if that helps explain it. I, I'm at a little bit of a loss because I'm characterizing what somebody else said about what they were thinking about in those, in those other years. And I, I, um, I know 2005 it was very intentional. The other years, I'm not sure. What I do know, however, this is what happened. Um, these were the increases. Whether we want to call it intentional or unintentional, there were uh, a series of increases in the tax levy that exceeded the rate of inflation, and the reason is for the reasons I explained. The court. And, and, and just to, because we're, and again, I'm, I'm, I recognize that you are, that you are not on the school board during this time, <laughs> and, and, and that you are sort of reconstructing to the best of your recollection, but for for each of these unrecognized phases, was there District 200 board action uh, on an annual basis? I think there was. Yeah, they they, they wouldn't have gotten this money had they not yeah, left. That, that's you can't pass a budget without your board voting on it. Yeah, that's. I, I was clarifying this intentional yes. one, and yeah, I, I think choice was at how you phrased it at one point. That's probably more accurate. They, 
the people that were on the school board at the time made a choice every year in connection with their budget a, a consideration and adoption. That's and right. I, the, the only thing, I, and I, I'm not, since I wasn't on the board, I'm, I guess I'm sort of in a way trying to defend them, and I'm not sure that it's really right. I do know that, like in our board, the township, um, they'll always ask me, you know, how much do we love you for this year? Like, well, to be safe, and that is to make sure you get everything you're entitled to under the law, you should do, you know, maybe you might get 3%. You should love you for 5%, just to make sure you get everything you're entitled to under the law. So I suspect that the board here at the high school was doing that, um, and they just might have gotten more than expected. Well, and just to, and just to, to understand the context around this, there's also growth that goes on based on new development that's occurring in the community and other things. And that's going to come up, so I know that. And so to the extent that there could have been an anticipation that a project yeah. might be coming online mm -hmm. and that it was going to affect a particular tax year, the jurisdictions have the ability to be able to go and capture that, but only to the extent that they levy enough to be able to actually capture that incremental increase in value. So it would not be completely illogical for any of the jurisdictions in town to balloon their levy enough to be able to capture the incremental increase from a new development that might be anticipated to come on, even if they're not sure whether it's going to come on or not. Because as Ollie was saying, if it doesn't come on, there's the backstop that the assessor's office will knock you back down at the county level. And so it's possible that they could have been engaging in some of that to be able to try to make sure that they weren't missing out on new development coming online. Part that's sort of the, the relationship here, though, that it, that may not have been as readily apparent to everybody or people weren't necessarily thinking about was if that was what was motivating them to put in some of those increases, developments were not necessarily coming online, but they had this phase in situation, then all of a sudden dollars that they thought they might have been levying for to capture it from one source, in fact, were coming from a different source, which was the availability of the phase-in over the course of that four-year period, which could account for some of these increases. I mean, that's, that's, I wasn't in the room, I don't yeah. know, but it's at least one hypothesis as to how some of this could have happened. But I think you're right. At the end of the day, it's a choice. And looking back on an annual basis, it's impossible to miss that you ask for X and your increment is going up by a certain percentage year over year versus the prior year. That's how we got here. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, what we really need to focus on is, okay, where are we going from here? Right, I'm not going to suggest that we move on. I, I, I said from the beginning it's important for us to try to understand as best we can what happened during this period, but also not to um, relitigate it. Uh, and so it, it, uh, so I appreciate David having some alternative hypothesis to the, they didn't know what they were doing, um, right. or they did. And, uh, 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 but coming back to just looking at the numbers, I think is uh, very enlightening hard numbers on what happened during that period. So um, if everybody's okay with that, I'd like to kind of keep going here. I can just say one other thing that David reminds me of. This was also the time when we had the carve-outs for the TIF. That is, TIF money was being released by the village to the tax industry, <coughs> which also everybody knew was going to be additional money but didn't know how much. So that was another thing. Um, okay, so. Now, after all this stuff, this, this controversy, finally in 2006, we're done with the phase-in, okay? We're, we no longer can you phase in that referendum from 2002, and the school was able to resume its normal increases based on inflation. And, and this is sort of obvious. This, is, this has been an enduring controversy in the community, this whole issue. Now, one thing I did last year, a, a taxpayer from River Forest came in and asked me to do a, a what was an interesting calculation um, uh, and, and use it for purposes I did not anticipate. But nonetheless, I, I want to repeat some of the information that, that was gleaned. Um, how much extra money actually was received from the phase in? Um, and what I did, and what she asked, asked me to do, and what I agreed to do over a long calculation is where would the school have been in terms of its cap levy had it received that first referendum, but nothing more? After that, it went back to what District 97 got, which is just regular increases due to inflation. 
Um, and and we'll also take, we also accounted for new growth and that sort of thing. And compared to what the school actually got in all of these years. Uh, and then the question was, and what's the total cumulative amount? Um, and, you know, I get this sort of angry face because this is the kind of, the, the people get mad when they see these numbers because they're pretty significant numbers here if you add it up over a period of years. Um, because as we said before, once you have this in your, in your tax base, it increases and increases. So uh, as of last year, I calculated 102 million extra dollars have been levied at Oak Park and Ruby Forest because of this phase and that's the cumulative amount compared to what it would have been had there just been that original $6.5 million in 2000. Oh, I just want to yeah. add just a slight caveat to that, that that would have seen no phasing and no additional referendum. Correct, right. correct. There may very well have been a need for a referendum had that not been the truth. That's exactly the truth. Um, nonetheless, I think it's an interesting bit of information, and it's something that, you know, I mean, there was a meeting here at the high school last December over the lobby, and I, I'd be a little upset about it. We, we remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have uh, another section to go over. I don't know if we want, if we want to just plow right through or what? Plow right through. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Please. So. Tax levies can't raise by, rise by more than the rate of inflation unless you're the governor of the village of Oak Park, and unless there's a successful referendum or C, unless there's new growth and or expiration of the um, So the legislature thought, hey, you know, if I get a bunch of new homes in my community, I may need more than the regular inflation level increase to, to educate all those new kids that are gonna come into my home, uh, into my community. You got a growing community, you got new, new properties in the community, uh, a legitimate, a school or a, any taxing district legitimately might need more money to cover the expenses of those new properties and those people. So they created an exception, a sort of a complicated exception under the law that allows for additional money to be obtained by a district above and beyond the rate of inflation when there's new growth. And we've sort of been alluding to that a little bit uh, in the conversation before. Um, okay, and this is achieved by applying the district's tax rate on. Now, I have a way of trying to explain this to folks, because this is sort of a complicated uh, idea to grasp. Um, so I'm trying to make this a simple example. Hopefully, everybody will agree it's simple. Okay, so let's imagine we have this little community here, and you got the, the, the red house is the new growth, okay? Uh, and to make things simpler, also assume that under the tax gap, the tax rate last year was 10 bucks a house, okay? 10 bucks a house. The houses all look the same, so it may be a reasonable and assume further there are 10 houses last year. Okay, so we got a rate of 10 bucks a house, we got 10 houses last year, and there are a lot of smart people in the room, so can you tell me, the 10 houses, at 10 bucks a house, what was last year's tax level? I, I see somebody smiling over there. What do you, what do you think, it's 10 houses? Last year's levy was? 100. He's right, $100 was last year's tax level. Give that a minute um, okay, so let's imagine this year the inflation rate is 5%. So what's our tax rate per house going to be this year? $10 per house, 5% increase. What's the, what's the rate? Anybody have an idea? No, I'm sorry. Two for two over there. Okay, so the rate is 10 to 50 in the new year because you have a 5% increase. So here's the tricky last year's levy was $100, what is this year's levy? Is it A, $100, B, $105, C, $115.50, D, $120.50, or E, I have no idea. <laughs> 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 this is assuming the new house that came on. What's that? This is assuming the new house that Yes, exactly. So, we have an idea. What's our new year? This new year levy? This levy for the new year? It's either C or D. Uh, C. All right, I heard, I heard C. And they're right. C is our big number. Okay. So, the rate's 10 to 50 a house. There are now 11 houses instead of 10. 10 to 50 envelope, 115 dollars and 50 cents. What's the point of this? Each existing house has a 5% tax increase, right? From $10 to 10.50. But the government revenue has gone up by more than 5%. Okay, because of that new red house, it's gone up by 15%, 15.5%, $100 to 
So this is a way that, uh, I hope this is simple enough to understand, um, this is a way in which government, local government under tax caps can get tax increases that exceed the rate of inflation when there's new growth. Um, and and it's, it's sometimes sort of attractive because an existing taxpayer, you know, the government can extra money, but the existing taxpayers don't pay that much. Um, so the government revenue grows, grows by more than inflation. That's important, especially for schools, when oftentimes the expenses for retirement, salary, and health insurance and other things increase by more than the rate of inflation. So this is a way the school districts can try to cover those costs. Now, it does have a downside, because I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've, you know, when, during the boom time, how can we have all this new development, no growth, and my tax bills never go down? And then people sort of think, you know, greater tax base, I should have a lower tax bill. That never seems to happen. Um, but that can only happen if the school districts or the other districts don't use that extra money. Um, they have the right to levy the extra money, but as I said before, it's an option, it's a choice. Um, and uh, by far and away, the local school districts, not only school districts, tax districts, township, every district has chosen to use these exceptions to capture that extra money. But it is possible that some of those dollars are going into your uh, fund balance that you are putting off and paying for a referendum increase, and so there is, in fact, a differential impact for the taxpayer down the line as well. There's, there's at least that set of options. Yeah, well, right, right. I mean, it's down the line, but I, I think the... Uh, well, and the only, the only point is just actually answering the question, how come there's all this new construction and my tax not coming down? And that's, that's the simpler reason is it's being spent um, or being, being levied for it. Levy for it. Okay, so let's talk about tip districts a little bit. Um, there's a long history of controversy regarding the tip districts. When I talked to Jeff, he, he didn't realize that the very first lawsuit involving a tip was not from District 200, but in fact was from District 97. So I thought I'd just make sure everybody aware of that. <laughs> Back the, the, in the, wall, the walls in this room appreciate being <laughs> Happened Back in 1984, and there's still a consequence today because the downtown tip pays about 22 and a half percent of its revenue to local taxes because of that uh, that lawsuit. Okay, but we're not going to talk about the history. That's 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 ancient history as far as I'm concerned. Um, in a TIF district, new growth goes into a special fund controlled by the municipality. Ordinarily, new growth goes to the taxing district, the school district, and everybody else, and they can use that to get above inflation revenue, but not when there's a TIF. When there's a TIF, it goes into a special fund. The schools can access that growth after the TIF expires, but not during the pendency of the TIF. Well, you can see where you might have controversy. Um, at least in the, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons, pro and con, I don't really want to get into that, but, you know, who's going to get the access to this growth is, is an issue that drives a lot of the controversy over the Just, Go ahead. Ali, just to clarify, it's not only new growth that's increasingly a medium sized tip, so it doesn't have to be new construction, that's just the other thing you're talking about. That's correct, that's correct, it's, yeah, it's the way it would be right. Okay. In 2010, uh, there was a tip expiring in the community of Room 4. Um, and in that year, the inflation was 2.7%. Um, but because of the tip expiring, it was treated as new growth, like that new red house, and it allowed the districts in Room 4 to get more than just 2.7%. And if you look at the, at the figures here, it was quite a bit more. 13% um, for 90, 12.5% for the village of Room 4. Okay. This is all these large increases. Now, the, the, I became aware of this because somebody asked me to run these numbers. They had large increases in their levy, but the average taxpayer in the forest didn't pay large tax increases because this all came from a separate source. It was previously going to the TIP fund. Suddenly, it was going into the coffers and those were taxing different than professional um, We had something similar here in Oak Park. Uh, we haven't had a TIP expire, but we've sort of downsize some of our tips through the carve-out agreement, um, and that also released money to the local taxing districts. Um, so if we uh, go back, the main point here, you can get revenue above and beyond the rate of inflation if you're the government, a park, successful referendum, or if there's the end of the tip. 
skip. Um, and I want to look at one thing, which is looking at each local taxing district, uh, see how the levies have grown since 1999, since that's been the issue. Um, since 1999, the level of inflation was 37.7%, and this shows the growth level of some of the key districts in the community since then. And I've tried to sort of more or less explain how it all happened. Um, and, and you can see for a lot of them, I mean, we have had in our two communities a lot of successful referendums. I mean, people sometimes say the pass rate of referendums in Cook County is 30%. Well, in Oak Park, it's 100%, at least going back the last 18 years. Uh, in River Forest, too. So we have had successful referendums at School District 97, School District 90, School District 200, the Oak Park Park District, and the Oak Park Public Library. And we actually had another one in District 97 for the new middle schools that were built in 1999. So we're, and Oak Park is, Six for six in terms of referendum. River Forest is uh, two for two. So this 20 to 30% pass rate that people sometimes talk about does not seem to apply to our community. Um, and I mentioned this partly, you know, earlier we said, I showed you uh, the angry face of the taxpayer who's mad about the big increases uh, in the, the levies compared to the rate of inflation. But, you know, to a large extent, if people are upset about that, they've got to look in the mirror because it, for the most part, the decisions that were made were made by the voters in Oak Park. Now, granted, they were not over course. Granted, these were not 100% victory. Uh, most people probably didn't vote at all, and they were usually 60, 40, 55, 45, or something like that. Nonetheless, um, you know, the reason you see such large increases relative to the rate of inflation for almost all these taxing districts is due to referendum. And there's a few other things, Jeff, you wrote None of these are value judgments, these are just numbers that we're, we're putting on. Uh, it's just because the state of Illinois doesn't appear anywhere there, but in fact they're a driver behind some of the material increases in cost of government. Right. 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 No, I'm just saying the cost of government is all I'm focusing on, not really the cause, because there's, there's a lot of causes, and obviously that's one. I may be an important one. Um, okay, so that's the, I have a little something about, I think it's, yes, share the tax burden, which I, 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 uh, I can go through because, uh, but I don't know, if that, that's, that's, I think the levies are kind of the main issue, um, so I don't know if there are any other questions about, about levy related issues, or I can just finish it up and we can. Yeah, once you do okay. the share of the tax burden, then we'll come okay. back, but I do think it's worth it. All right, and this is, sorry for our friends at River Forest. I don't have this data for report, it's only for Oak Park. Um, so far we've talked about overall levies of all properties in Oak Park and River Forest, which is very important to talk about. But we haven't talked about levies with any particular classes of properties. And I think that's that's important to really get an idea of how, how taxpayers and voters feel about this stuff. I don't have the River Forest data. Um, but I have this information, which is, is quite an interesting graph, I think. Um, 2001, the one in red, uh, Homeowners in Oak Park were carrying about 70% of the freight. That is, of the total tax levy for Oak Park, 88 million or whatever the number was, 70% of it was paid by homeowners, and the remaining 30% was paid by businesses, which could be commercial property, large apartment buildings, or more con or, or one industrial property, that sort of thing. Um, and over the last decade, there has been a real shift in, in that. Uh, such that last year, the 11 taxes paid 12 when we were last reassessed, homeowners were going up from 70% to 81%. In meantime, business properties had declined um, from 30% to about 19%. Um, and so, why did this happen? Why have we seen this shift? There's a lot of reasons. One is because the home values were increasing so dramatically, they outpaced increases in any other property type. Uh, during that time period. We've had changes in county tax policy uh, that have also lowered the level of assessment on apartment buildings and commercial properties. Uh, and we also had some condo conversions too. Large apartment buildings that were once called businesses 
became individual condos in our home. So all those things sort of combined. But this has really exacerbated the effect of rapidly rising tax levies because not only do you have levies going up 93% over a, a long period of time, but homeowners are paying an increasingly higher share of that 93%. Um, and so I did this, this number that uh, you know, we had a 93% levy increase between 99 and 11. And yet if you look at the homeowner's share, it was up 125%, more than double, um, because the homeowners were paying a greater share of that higher levy. Um, and uh, you know, there's a decline in the share of the And uh, so, if we can end, why are the successful referendums phase in? Go ahead. Can, can I ask a quick question Please? here? Um, did you notice any uh, shrinkage in the number of properties considered business? And you mentioned the conversion from apartments to condos. I mean, was it you know, a, a significant percentage or minimal? Well, I, I think there's, there's, in terms of the number of properties, I don't think other than apartments to condos, the number of properties hasn't changed. But there is an issue in terms of the, every year there's, there's, a, there's a question of value, which is, you know, in 2002, homes were increasing by about 46% in value, but businesses were not. Um, and so home value significantly, their growth in home value significantly outpaced the growth in business value. And that meant that homes had a greater share of the tax burden than businesses. Uh, no, I was thinking more like, um, you know, let's say look on Madison Street and some things that used to be commercial use is now a residential use. Well. Yes, there would be some of that. There would be some of that. There would be part of that also. I don't think, I mean, I, I think that the main issue, that's, I don't think it's the main issue. The, the, the other things are the drive for it. All right, so many successful referendums. Why have taxes increased so much? The phase in of the high school, TIF expiration, carve outs, new growth, shift to the tax code. So, that's my presentation, um, and, and I certainly, any, any questions, any discussion? Yeah, just one other comment, um, during, I can't remember what years you probably do, there was also a shift within homeowners because of the whole hand 7% cap that phased in, phased out, and just caused extra bouncing. There was one chart you had up, you know, five, 10 years ago where condo owners and bungalow owners saw cuts in their taxes and people with houses over $500,000 saw double, you know, 20% increases. And so even within the homeowner class, it's not a uniform class. And then some of that's being reversed out, right? Well, that's, yeah, David and I were at the meeting when we were, you know, dodging eggs that were being thrown and that sort of thing, <laughs> trying to explain all this craziness. But yes, there was, within the homeowner class, there have been some shifts as So very much thank you for including River Forest's data as, as well as you do. I think it really will give us a flavor for our whole, our whole community here. So um, we can spend five more minutes if people have other reactions or questions for, for Ollie. Um, uh, I think we've been asking them as we've gone, so I think we're going to take a chance. So Judy, please. Better than I do, but on the so if I look at the districts currently, they're rated like 3.05, and you had said they were trying to hit 2.9. And over time, then does the rate of inflation impact rate, or how did they get? How does the district get more rate? I believe 2.9. I, be I, I don't know. I believe it's that's just the education fund is a 2.95, and uh, oh, so other right. things. Back then, when you, back then when you did referendums, it was just by fund. And then I think it was 2006, like Bob said, that they stopped doing that. And it was then it was your total limiting rate exclusive of your uh, final neutral carbon. Right. I just had a, I guess it's more an observation than anything else. And it, it's a little philosophical. But one of the things that you uh, talked about was the, the whole no 
notion of getting what you're entitled to in terms of when you, you know, go for your the, the highest rate that you can get. And I'm just struck by this fund balance that we have and the whole notion of getting what you need as opposed to getting as much as you can. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And also in terms of the discussion that we've just had and the, the angry faces, because I had that face and looked at my tax bill, I still don't get, I still don't get what, you know. And I think that that is a, something that we're gonna have to talk about how we um, educate or how we give this information out to the community at large, or at least attempt to, so there isn't that whole uh, notion that we're, this is all something that we have, have, have done, that we you know, are taking this money in, in, uh, when in fact, you know, the years taxes have gone up no matter what we're doing. So I think that's something we're going to have to figure out how to articulate is the role that the, the District 200 plays within a bigger system as opposed to that high school that's you know, getting all this money. I would say I, I think it's a, a valid point. One of the things that, um, you know, I, I once worked in, in, in Berwyn. For two years, I was the Berwyn Township Assessor. And <clears throat> I saw kind of a different approach to taxes in Oak Park. I mean, there was, I was surprised because I saw uh, the Berwyn Township Board that actually didn't increase its level, even though it could. Um, and I, I think that, that for a long time, I think the, the approach of Oak Park taxing districts is, you know, under the tax cap law, it's use it or lose it. We better use it and get it right now because otherwise we're never gonna, never gonna be able to get it again yeah. unless we have a referendum. Um, and I think for the first time I saw really a change in that this in Oak Park but this year at the high school when it, it did not take all the money it was entitled to it. And, and, and I think the high school board probably more than the others have really, you know, it's, it's that idea of use it or lose it get it now has reached its zenith here. Jack, as a follow up, I'm going to quote you for a minute on this. Bob, Bob has said to me before that this tax cap law was meant as a ceiling and in some ways uh, has been treated as a floor. Um, and, and, and it's really legitimate to ask a question whether that's appropriate. Peter. Hey, Ali, I, I have a question. I know you've been kind of sticking to the facts and not why necessarily some of these policy decisions were made, but I probably do have some insight. You know, why the change? in assessment rates for multifamily uh, over time. And it's been a dramatic reduction. And, and it, was that Cook County driven or was that state driven? And do you know what the policy implication behind that was? Yes, and in fact, it's county driven. I do, it is county driven. And it, this, this, sh this chart here shows that in 1989, multifamily, that's apartment building seven units or more, was 13% of our tax base in our park. And by 2011, it was under five and a half percent, so it was a pretty dramatic drop. Uh, I, I think the big reason is kind of that is to say, under the old regime, if before two thousand two, if you owned an apartment building, your assessed value, which will determine your taxes. Let's put it this way: if you had an apartment building worth a hundred thousand, the assessed value would be thirty-three thousand, thirty-three percent. If that same building were converted to condominiums, okay. Uh, and each condo were worth 100,000, the assessed value on the condo would be just 10,000. Okay, so you had a situation where um, an apartment building was assessed at 33% of market value, a condo building assessed at 10% of market value. Right. Well, that's kind of a built-in incentive to convert your building. And there are other reasons to convert it also, many other reasons going on, but certainly there was a tax incentive that says, we're gonna give you as a developer you know, the taxes are going to be lower. That means you're, you can probably sell your condos for more because the, the cost of operating the condo is going to be cheaper. So the policy decision was to try and save rental units. Correct. Equalize. Equalize. Yeah. And also to save it on another front in terms of the profitability of those apartment units as a viable business with large scale landowners requesting a
know, in, a, a, in a situation right. where ultimately that was passed through to a rental, right. uh, a, a rental uh, resident rather than an ownership resident. I'm going to um, observe the fascinating policy issues embedded in all of this, and, and uh, we could keep going deeper into it. But I think that um, uh, it's been tremendously helpful. Welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but uh, uh, we uh, will understand if you just and this will live on the web as well. Passing that off. Oh yeah, well, let, all other documents. let me get some of this. I mean, I, we, I don't know if we need all the angry faces and that sort of stuff on the web. I'd actually rather prefer they not be on the web. Um, <laughs> but um, I can get the the, the, the facts and figures and that sort of stuff. And, and I don't know. If we, I don't know how you want to do it. But it seems like the you know, the fourth house. versus actual variances that we were talking about last time. Uh, and then uh, after that, the beginning to talk about key drivers of the projection model, and those are just kind of related to each other. So, uh, so I'm going to hand, hand it over to Todd for whatever it takes. Before that, I just want to say, I, I knew Bob was going to be the one who got those numbers. <laughs> Teamwork over here. <laughs> 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 we gotta split you guys up because you're gonna be <laughs> passing notes in class. <laughs> yep. Okay, this is our last meeting. I Gary, if you could hold Gary, if you could hold off on the angry faces. Since our last meeting, I was asked to go back and, and uh, I know Steve Miller from PMA presented some data from 2007 all the way to the end of last fiscal year, 2012, which was actually six fiscal years. And there were some variances on the revenue side and the expenditure side. And um, over the last week or so, uh, I, the business office staff and I have dug into those variances. Now, we didn't go to into every single one, but we went and we looked at what I call larger variances. And um, so on that sheet that Steve presented a few weeks ago, we had a total revenue variance for that six year period of $9.5 million. So I took just the largest variances of 8.2 million on the revenue side, which was, which was the education fund property taxes, the operations and maintenance fund property taxes, and then uh, interest earnings. Uh, uh, just a clarification. This is cumulative. This is the cumulative number over the over yes. the six years that we were looking at. Cum cum yeah, very good. Uh, cumulative n number over six years, right? So in the Ed Fund and in the Operations and Maintenance Fund for property taxes, um, I kind of broke it out on an annual basis. What the annual average was, and part of it, part of the variances that that we discovered is uh, part of it's just due to uh, conservative budgeting. In place before I got here, um, and, and how the person, and how it was all budgeted, and then the other thing is that um, historically we were budgeting as if we were only collecting 97 percent of our property taxes each year, and in a minute, in a few minutes, when we get to the major drivers, the key drivers, I'm going to show you that our collection rate the last couple of years has been uh, over 98 percent. So I think moving forward. I know that's one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to increase our assumptions for collections from 97 to 98 uh, percent, and, and you'll see on the next the next sheet that I hand out, you'll see what kind of an effect that makes, and it's it's going to pretty much match up to what what's in there. Not not exactly, but pretty but pretty darn close. Um, and then uh, interest earnings in the education fund. Um, 
Now you're probably thinking, well, the interest rates have been terrible the last few years, and uh, why would these be up? Well, uh, in my narrative there, over a six-year period, it's an a annual average of $325,000, um, especially, and remember, this period is FY, fiscal year ending June 30th, 2007. So if you take June 30th, 2007, and June 30, 2008, we had two, uh, we still had two pretty good years where we were getting nice returns on our, on our investments. So um, in those two years, it was, it was more than what we were anticipating for, uh, for interest earnings. So that, um, that's about $8.2 million of the variance uh, between the two property taxes of our two biggest funds, uh, the education fund and the operation and the maintenance fund, and then the interest earnings. Um, that's, that's about $8.2 million with the 9.5 of that uh, cumulative um, uh, revenue variance. On the other side, on, on the other side of the books, the expenditure side, um, Steve Miller presented uh, based on the information from the uh, five site, um, forecast five uh, data that we had a total expenditure variance of about 22.6 million. And I did the same thing uh, just for the sake of time, but to try to carve out what our, what our, ver our major variances be. Um, so I got it down to about 8.5 million. Uh, again, just looking at the major variances, there were a lot of minor ones along the way and trying to go back and recreate six years worth of history and digging some of that up. Um, takes a little more time than what I had to do. So again, uh, that, that's what I kind of did. So for the Ed Fund and salaries over, over a six year period, it was about $3.2 million um, that we were, we were a, a variance. Uh, we were $3.2 million under budget. Um, so on an av annual average, it's about $537,000 a year. Uh, part of this is that the district had included dollars in the budget for fac faculty salary lines, to accommodate step and lane changes. Um, it's hard to predict every year um, when faculty are going to complete uh, various coursework degrees that would make them move over a lane and, and get a pay increase mid-year. Um, so they budgeted for that. Uh, additionally, um, there's other staffing needs that come up at the beginning of the school year and second semester, a lot of times due to student enrollment or course offerings. Um, that were budgeted for, so money was put in the budget. Additional dollars were, were budgeted for that. Um, also, when we look back, there was there were a couple years when additional monies were budgeted for safety and salary, or I'm sorry, um, uh, safety and support, overtime, and extra duties, um, and that money hadn't always fully been expended. Um, one year they budgeted a contingency um, in the safety and support lines. That was the year that. Um, the district implemented the uh, modified closed campus program. And um, then another year after that, um, in addition to all those, um, they budgeted a 3% increase because they were negotiating with an employee group and the budget had to be set uh, in September. They, they budgeted 3% and when, when everything negotiated, when everything settled, it settled at a 2%. And then one thing that I always struggle with, um, and I'm sure that the, from what we saw looking at past history, it's always challenging to try to budget accurately for substitute teachers uh, every year. Uh, you, you don't always know who's going to be taking a leave, uh, who's going to become pregnant in a year, uh, what kind of illnesses might be going around. Um, maybe folks uh, take a day or two because they're, they're sent to do some professional development off campus. Um, so uh, again, I always find that budgeting for substitutes are, are tough. The next area is uh, the educational fund again and benefits. And um, over a six year period, uh, it was an annual average of 1.5. And this one's a little bit hard to explain. And part of it is because we're a self-funded district in terms of health insurance. Um, so for the state budget and the annual financial report, we have to, we have to record uh, what we, our net income or net loss for our self-insurance in the ad fund because there is no, if you remember from one of the first nights when I did the overview of the budget and the funds, there, there is no insurance fund. So it's basically our auditors had recommended years ago when we, when we went to the self-funded model 
to, to put, to, to roll it into the educational fund. And um, we've had really good claim history over the past few years. And, it, and essentially we've had a net income. So um, that means that our, basically our premiums have been set right where they should be, or maybe even a little higher than they need to be. And our claims and administrative fees came in lower than that. So we were actually achieving, um, we, were, we were actually, in one sense, maybe achieving a small profit from, from our insurance. Additionally, um, because we're self-funded, uh, we're on a calendar year rather than a fiscal year basis with our insurance benefits. So uh, January 1st, the new claim year starts, and we have the first six months' worth of experience. You can kind of trend it from the, from the previous six months of, of the previous fiscal year, but then um, the district had traditionally used 10% for that second half of the uh, fiscal year, and what we found looking back is that um, the actual increase um, for benefits for, for health insurance for that second semester was anywhere from three to five percent. So that's an area that we're going to need to, uh, that I've already talked with uh, Steve about and Jeff about, is how to trim that down and get a little closer uh, in the future. Um, purchase services, $3.2 million over six years. So annually it's about $549,000. Uh, we couldn't find really one trend um, as to what happened, <coughs> why we were so under budget in purchase services. Um, we found some things, for example, copy machine replacements came in lower than we, we planned for. Uh, strategic planning was budgeted for one year, wasn't done until the following year. Um, there were, and, and legal fees are uh, you never know what they're going to be from year to year. You can always make a guess, but based on the situations you may have, um, they, they could be higher or lower uh, each year um, based on that. So uh, when, when we analyzed it, really it was just a lot of small lines kind of added together. It wasn't, there wasn't one big trend. Like, you know, like I said, uh, we did find copy machines and a few other things, but it wasn't one big thing that we went to. Um, education fund, other objects. Uh, 1.9 million dollars over six years so annually it's about three hundred twenty three thousand dollars and that's basically due to special ed special education private facility tuition and the number of students that we send of, of our students who because of their needs um, have to go outside of the district for services or for private placements and um, again uh, that's going to be based on the needs of the children so every year that that could fluctuate and um, I think more than likely what, what, we, what we saw happen uh, is that we budgeted high because we expected the worst case scenario and in many years the worst case scenario didn't happen and uh, especially with RTI and a few other initiatives in the last few years, uh, you know, the goal is always we want to try to keep the students here at the high school as much as possible. Explain RTI briefly. Uh, response to instruction or intervention. system of responding to students that we were using perhaps in the past. So it's a possibility. Off-campus placement is always hard, though, to predict. Great. Thank you. And then just one year in the operations and maintenance fund for the year, fiscal year ending June 30, 2010 for capital outlay. Uh, that year we saw about a $1 million difference. Uh, we were under budget that year. and. Um, most likely we had projected that construction was going to get done at a certain point that year. It wasn't. And um, at, at June 30th year end, we were, we were under budget because a certain portion of the construction hadn't been completed. So in the, in the about a week or so that I've had, um, that's, the, uh, that's the, uh, the detective work that I was able to do with uh, the budget variances and trying to put six years worth of history back together again to try to unravel where we got to. So I will ask, I don't answer any questions. Thoughts, questions? Thoughts, questions? 
Well, help me too, because. I was just going to say, my observation would be yes. you probably got the most out of it. I did. As you did. start to construct a budget in the spring again. Yes. And especially when, when I amend this coming spring, it'll be, it'll be more helpful for me. So, And then construct the next year's budget moving forward. Absolutely. You know, I'll also say on that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, that the question of um, you know, all these variances add up, but, you know, all of them on the, on the um, conservative side. That's from the amended. That's uh, that's from from the amended budget. That's that's uploaded to the state. Um, the one thing I want to say was that yeah, uh, particularly with the amended budget, that that's you know some of these variances are a little pleased for that. But conservative budgeting is less of a problem than the compounding of conservative forecasting because absolutely you know, you know when you're forecasting high sometimes, low sometimes for a budget just because of the nature of the way government budgets work to certain things you need to be conservative when you don't get compounded when you get a forecast because the numbers can get squirrely very quickly. Good point. Okay. So it's a little bit more about that later. But, um, any other questions on this? It's very helpful time. So thank you for, I know this was a lot of work <laughs> for you and for Doug. So Well, and appreciate that. So, take your second piece. I will take my second piece. Sure. This also was a result of a conversation in our last meeting in August. And I believe it was Tom Kofsky who had asked this or had, had been one of the people that spoke to this need and that was with most school districts there's usually certain uh, key, key drivers I'll call them on the revenue side and the expenditure side uh, if you as you're making as you're doing projections as you're looking to uh, make reductions make changes uh, make recommendations um, so what I did with again with Steve Miller's help from PMA as we looked at um, what are those drivers. So we looked at the revenue side, the expenditure side, and then kind of the heads up, what's on the radar uh, side of things. So property tax revenue, um, obviously there's two big factors there. Uh, one is the CPI, and you heard Ali talk about that a lot tonight, the, the rate of inflation, and the other is the collection rate. And, um, those have the most effect on property taxes since that's our largest portion of uh, revenue that we receive. So there's from levy year 2008, and you see that we had a collection rate that year of 95.7, 2009, 97.3, and then the last couple of years we get into that 98% range. And then 2012, it says 94.9 with a little star next to it, and that's because uh, that's through August. We haven't got all of our, we haven't received all of our collections yet from from the uh, 2012 levy. So uh, we're 
we're getting close, but we're not quite there yet. And then you, you, you see that the assumptions moving forward uh, in, the, in the projection model that Steve Miller presented last time all had 97% for the collection rate, and that had 2% uh, for the CPI. Now, if you've been following CPI, I mean, look at that history, 4.1 in the famous 0.1 year in 2009, 2.7, 1.5, 3. This levy year, it's going to be 1.7. So you see the up and down effects, uh, kind of the uncertainty of CPI. It's kind of hard to get a, it's kind of hard to get a good pattern uh, there. But we've got 2.0 plugged in for this 2% for the CPI. But we are going to modify that collection rate to probably 90. And you, you, you can see kind of the, the sensitivity, how much 0.5 in CPI would bring. Uh, it would generate about $325,000. And one, an extra 1% collection rate would be about $650,000. And if you went back to, the, if you go back to that budget variance sheet, that $650,000 is pretty close. And yet it's not exact, but it's, uh, it's in the ballpark on that ad fund on an annual average annual basis. So that's the revenue side. On the, on the other side, the two major drivers is, the, uh, is, is basically enrollment, and it's our, it's our costs for um, uh, staffing costs. And since our teachers are our, our largest employee group, uh, that's a good portion of what drives that. I was wondering if you would like to talk about the enrollment piece, and I will add on to that because we talked about that. Um, if you look, and the reason I want to point this out, if you look at 2012 and 2013, um, it, and actually even if you look at 2011, enrollment was 3150, and we had 231.5 FTE as far as faculty work. Right, then the next year, enrollment went up to 3268. And then it shows a decrease of FTE to 228.1, and then uh, a very similar trend the following year. Uh, we talked about this at, at leadership team today. Uh, Steve, I'll let you sure. pipe in, and then I'll, uh, I'll add on. So for the fiscal year of 2012 was the last year we used our Casarda projections before we went to Ehlers for the projection numbers. And I just pulled it up and I was looking right here. So in 2011-12, fiscal 12, we were expecting uh, 3,102 students. So you can see what the actual was. And this is where we were saying we were getting a little bit surprised by the numbers. We were always coming a little bit low. So it, we're talking to district administration to try and, and see what would be, what would account for some of the changes in numbers. And one of the changes in the number, of course, is the enrollment was not what we were projecting at that particular time, and so we have a change there. We looked at some of our history in that year, and we noticed that in different, it was actually spread throughout the various divisions in regard to where there were some decreases in sections and whatnot. And so we do know that there was a decrease in the FTE based on some of the working with the sections. We also know that there was an increase in that particular number than what we expected because of the enrollment figure. Um, in fiscal year 13 and also in this year of 14, we're finding we're working with Ehlers and their projection numbers. And they were actually, I don't have what they were projected, but I do recall as last year we were much closer, closer to it yeah. and we were much yeah. more comfortable with the number. And this year we're actually on target with what they were ex uh, expecting. Um, however, there is a change in terms of the FTE there, and that is the reason for that is that we are one less librarian right now and three dean positions uh, were moved into, going into last year um, when they became student intervention directors. Right. And so they, the, the FTE was actually moved out of the uh, faculty uh, numbers and put into administration numbers. So there's, for some of the nuances that occurred there. I thought it was important that we try to figure out what some of the history was because the, the numbers don't make sense if you just look at them. So I have a quick question and I'm spending a little bit of time with the capper so I, so I might seem like a geek, but 
the average daily attendance versus enrollment, which is better to drive the expenses? The number of students that we believe are going to be here. Yeah. Because nope. that determines our section. Yep. It determines how many classes we're going to run and how many students are in the classes. That in turn determines our staffing needs and how many people we need and because largely our budget is based upon staffing. That's right. So what drives the difference in average daily attendance? So average daily attendance in 2012 was 2,881, which was significantly less than the year before. So what drives the difference between enrollment and average daily attendance? Is it cost per student in the CAFA based on average daily attendance, not on enrollment? So with the average daily attendance, I know we report uh, exactly which date it is that we report um, our attendance numbers to. It used to be six day, but now I think it's September 30th. That's what we report. And so that's what the number that we report to the, to the uh, state in terms of what our attendance is. But it's enrollment that drives the cost, Always even if you had enrollment. far fewer students in the actual classroom? Well, the atten attendance Keep in mind in this actual enrollment number here, um, this number may also include our special ed students. So right. we're looking at placement of special ed students. So it's, it, we have to always consider everything and not necessarily just the number of bodies that are in the, in the building. We also have mobility, so the number is constantly fluctuating as well. But we build, we have to build the schedule based upon a predicted number. Right, so we have we have a sense of the number of students that are enrolling. We have to consider how what is our typical uh, number of transfer students that are coming in, so that we always have this the spaces available for students. We're building it in the spring. The actual attendance we're not going to get until the year has started, and so you can't really work with an attendance number for that year because the students haven't arrived. So you have to use a predictor in order to be able to to figure out how you're going to staff your classes, what classes you're going to decide to run, what electives go, which ones don't go. Um, are you going to do, 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 do a single ten of a class? Or you do so Judy, you're actually, you're asking a management question though. If, if average daily attendance is 96%, I don't know what the number is of, of, um, of the enrollment, uh, would that make much of a difference if you try to, to manage your function? Well, I'm trying to understand the difference between the two. Right. The and two other factors are general state aid. Well, not, I mean, that average daily attendance is used for general state aid. Right. But um, also kids being sick, on vacation, yeah. truant, all take away from average daily attendance. Do you decide how big your classes should be on the fact that two kids will, on average, be missing? I've, we have family friends who've been teaching one place in Colorado and didn't have enough desks. And they said, well, four or five kids will always be missing every day. Well, if they all show up, some of the scene on the radio. <laughs> yeah, so you have to sort of staff and do class sizes based on assuming everyone will enroll. If a flu goes through, yeah, and you can lose. And so, Bob, the main, reason that, the main reason that anybody who tracks um, average daily attendance is because it drives the state aid form. It drives the general state aid form. Right, right. But in terms of staffing level, it's, yeah, you know, that's you. what you really need. Okay. Please. I'll have to check where our estimates came from. I'll, I'll verify that. But they're probably line items in the budget, aren't they? Yes. How many, how many, how big is that? Yeah, and I, so I'm going to actually build on that question and to say, you know, we haven't gone all the way through this uh, chart yet, but, but is special ed tuition something that is a significant driver? Excuse me, Sheila? It's not a predictable number. It's not predictable, that's right. But, but what, percent, what percentage? What is it, average over the closing rate? Ours is bounced between like 2.2 .2 and 2.7 million. Now a chunk of that is reimbursed, so you have to look right. at how much of the variation is a net variation versus a gross variation. Okay.
So we don't, we don't need to answer that right now, but just as we talk, let's continue through this because we. Well, we the reason I'm asking them. is it sounds like the number of adjudicators is actually mathematically different at somewhere closer to 10% as opposed to uh, like 6% when we're looking at like 90%. Yeah, I couldn't do the numbers in my head. I just know, but that just seemed, that no, just seemed right. like That's a lot. That's why it, that seems like a lot to me. Yeah. So it's not like, it seems more than just kids being sick I on a I daily agree. basis. So yeah, true, maybe, I don't know. That's <laughs> well, because I know that, uh, Free spirit. Yeah, that attendance is taken after first period, or after Attendance is taken every period. Taken every period, yeah, so the high school's a little bit different, but I know that like if a child shows up late, sometimes they count only for a half day or something right. like that, and right. doctor's appointments. It just seems like a big number. Orthodontist appointments, no, no, I'm, right. So, lots of things going on. Yes, I will, Jeff. And the last piece, you know, we talked about the revenue side, we talked about the expenditure side, and then we talked about kind of the what to keep on the radar side, the what if side. And we we had a nice presentation at the last meeting from from Erica Lindley, and uh, also Steve Miller did a nice analysis of uh, potential uh, pension cost shift and what that would mean uh, for us over the next ten years and. Uh, basically, that that chart there is just copied from what from what they did that night, but it gives you an an idea of how quickly uh, if those pension costs were shifted back to us uh, or shifted to us, I should say, I shouldn't say back to us, shifted to us, what the impact would be. So I want to just ask everybody a question about what. When we, when we talk about key drivers, what are we trying to get at? Are we trying to get at the biggest piece of our budget, which is obviously salary, personnel, benefits, or are we trying to get at the most variable part of it? Why, why are we asking the question? Judy, you've been asking the question a lot, so I'm gonna actually put you on the spot to try to answer that. I, uh, I think that it's, it's good to know what the key variables items are in the budget, and then to understand what the key variables could be, and it's more about levers, or what could what could change the projections most. So what might vary the most? Right, or what yeah, might vary yeah, the most, yeah, but certainly yeah. need to understand what the biggest part And obviously the biggest right. number, right. right, the bigger the number, the smaller percentage variation it takes to have a big impact on the budget. So, so it sounded like you could pretty much predict what your, what your salaries were going to be almost down to the penny. You can predict some debt service down to the penny. There isn't much variation around it. You may not like the total number, but but you know what it's going to be. There are other things here where we're certainly seeing lots of variations that are meaningful for the budget. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to get a handle on what, what's driving the variations. If it's just conservative budgeting, you can fix that. But if it's truly a you know, an inability to predict. You need to you need to understand that when you project your what your fund balance should be. And then figuring oh, out you. how much flexibility you might have. The leverage you can have. Right. What kind of range you need yeah. to operate within? Because yeah. when you're faced with the reality of here's what actually the numbers are, mm -hmm. well now what do we do? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you, David. The other thing too is um, if there is offsetting, um, one of the things that has made District 97 financial for 
projections a little bit better is just due to the fact that we're still in the foundation level of the general state aid, so that when our enrollment increased, that in some cases we weren't projecting, we got increases in state funding. So that we were still not necessarily that accurate, but you were off both on the revenue side and on the expense side, so they sort of canceled each other out. Sort of the same thing, our last teacher's contract was tied to CPI, so that if we were off on our projection on, on the expenditure side, the revenue side went for the most part pretty well together. The 0.1 year kind of killed us a little bit because we had a minimum in there. But yeah, that uh, for the most part, that if you can have the projection such that there's offsetting elements to it, or at least be aware when you don't have offsetting elements, so that if you're wrong, it's going to diverge even further, as opposed to it's okay if your revenue, from a projection point of view, if your revenue and expenses are both off in the same direction, you're pretty much okay when they're off in opposite directions. Um, you have problems. Yeah, there's zero way to figure that. Um, the, the one missing lever in here, I just wonder is, you know, the previous discussion around budget variance, one of the largest variances was benefit. Not including that as a major lever, and I wonder why. Partially, I wanted to keep it under one sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's an honest answer. Honest answer. <laughs> but that is that is a reality. Is is benefit costs sure? But they're also going to be driven by your your staffing costs. So I mean, the, there's going to be a lot of that. Yeah, so Some, but, but, of staff. Oh, no. but it's good to identify that. Um, right. You know, like, we're going to have to figure out what to do with this. If you have historically forward. low claim experience, yeah. can you reasonably predict that's going to continue forever? And if no one, I can tell you, can look you in the eye and predict the actual outcome of the health care law right. change on a premium sure. two years ago. Yeah. You know, another, another, another and, 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 and Peter, another item we could put on here is construction or, right. or maintenance work or technology upgrades. I mean, those would all be, they, they could potentially be drivers as well. But those are very project specific. Yeah, I'm less worried about one-time CapEx as opposed to these long-term compounding. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. But, but I, I would also like to, you know, I think we also like, you know, at least over the near term, if, if there was big CapEx Right, and we will be talking about that um, in a couple of ways. One is is that we do have a long-term facilities plan going on, and we're going to um, start hearing from that committee at the board level this month, and uh, at this this committee in two meetings from now, October seventh. Um, and one of the connected questions to that is that the long the, 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 the five-year projection, which of course we need as a ten-year projection, <laughs> uh, has fairly significant capital budget line item and um, uh, how predictable that is and how that relates to the long-term facilities plan is a question we're going to have to understand better. Also, I think it, it is appropriate for it to be in, in there, high information about that at that level or, or not. So, so that's what I was going to say is that capital expenditures, if they're being run out of operating funds, you need to, yeah, that's something that is potentially a lever if it's going out into the future, right. right about that. Whereas if you're doing it out of, you know, bond sales, right. then right, then it's not a little it's different. Story. Yeah. So, so right now it's being financed out of the out of the ed fund, and, and so there's any others? That I, I think those are all the ones. That I, just I just had a comment um, with the with the with the cost of ratio that is not out of the, you know, that doesn't go crazy just because we're trying to keep costs at a certain level. And so this doesn't get, you know, at all of those things. And I just want to make sure 
sure that we make sure that we talk about the qualitative aspect of this as, as well as the the, yeah. the numbers because it, it is nuanced. It, it has to do with you know what contracts will look like, what teacher salaries will look like, what enrollment looks like, but overall you know we there's a quality of education that we're trying to provide and that has to be up here in terms of our discussion not forgotten as we talk about how we're going to deal with the, the numbers. Jeff? Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I would also like to add, I know that we're talking a little bit about, um, uh, about cost drivers on the budget and how it impacts the fund balance, but I think uh, the community members on this committee, we need to recognize you know, that we do have an elected school board. We've got some of them here, um, and, it, and that uh, perhaps management of expenditures is not squarely within the scope of this assignment. I just want to recognize that and state that for the record that, that all of us collectively here uh, recognize our mandate and that we're an appointed committee rather than uh, an elected board. Thank you. One other thing that's buried in the teacher staffing costs is the step increases that aren't are being considered a constant based on the schedule that PMA has in, but just like the base increase is something that is negotiable. Right, again, that, that goes to your same point is under a contract, it's, uh, it is what it is, but in the long term, it's over. Okay, I, I think I'd like to, to transition now to Todd. Thank you so much. Next, the next two items on the agenda say framework for developing guidelines and then next steps. Um, I've actually sort of rolled those uh, two things, three things really, because uh, they aim to the next steps together. Um, Todd's going to put up my, uh, hold on, hold on. Um, so you have to shrink it to get close. So now that's good enough. Uh, I just want to point out that um, I'm humbled by Ollie's uh, PowerPoint and <laughs> um, <laughs> what, you've, what you've got from me <laughs> is uh, 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 three word documents that I combined into one earlier today <laughs> and did a little cover sheet to say that um, these are my thoughts on reflections and next steps. Uh, but fun <laughs> fundamentally what I've, what I've tried to do is um, you know, I've been asking from the beginning, how are we gonna, are we gonna solve this problem? How are we gonna actually answer these questions? And as I think I said earlier, we've had a lot of discussion about it here. I've had some one-on-ones with people. And I need to have get my arms around it myself. So so I, I stepped back and started to try to organize it a little bit. And I'm just going to really reflect back to, to you all here what I've come up with. And, um, uh, and, and then we'll see where we go with it. So if we could go down to the next page, I'll see what I said there. Um, oh, this is... Um, but a good place to start was with the, uh, uh, the goals that we agreed, uh, you know, that the board asked us to do and we agreed we were gonna do. Um, the, the, the first three are really, I think, the focus for the, the phase of the work we're in now, which are uh, talking about recommended target range for the size of the fund balance, um, expectations for an operating referendum, and guidelines for future tax levies. Um, communication strategy continues to be a, a, a piece of this, but so the ongoing we'll talk about later, and the same with whether you know what sort of finance or budget we might need going forward. But fund balance, operating referendum, and, and tax levies are at the core of what we're being asked to make recommendations about. So let's see what I come up with there. Okay, so um, on this one, I also uh, you know we originally were going to try to do a lot of uh, this stuff tonight, and we decided not to. But there are there are still several pieces of sort of uh, uh, informational reports and analysis that we that I think we want to get. Um, so I just wanted to state those first. Uh, additional tax comparisons. I wasn't sure where Ali was going to get to, but the question of comparisons with other communities is a question that the that, that the board um, uh, uh, asked us to look at. Um, the impact on local businesses. 
those, those two, um, we've actually already had some discussions with folks who might be able to come to the next meeting to uh, make a presentation for us. Um, the impact on diversity, uh, I've talked to Rob Braymeyer over at the uh, Oak Park Regional Housing Center. I've gotten a little bit of data that I can share at the next meeting. Um, Todd's been doing some research on referendum experience and fund balance policy in other communities. So again, that's a, a piece that we can provide for the next time. And it, just to our, our own debt schedule and terms, which are part of this, we're, we're also, so those are all things that I'm actually thinking we can do at the next meeting, um, uh, and just so we have in mind where, where we're headed on that. Um, and then the long-term facilities plan will be at the October 7th meeting for the time with the board. Uh, and I also think this question of the interests of other local governing bodies, um, I'm not quite sure how much more there is to say about it, but I'd like the committee or, or, or some folks on the committee to think about that and think about whether there's more to say than uh, that uh, uh, District 97 will have, you know, have to go to a referendum sometime. <laughs> um, uh, you know, where District 90 is, how it, how it affects others. So we, we just need a little bit more conversation about whether, how much more information we need on that. Um, but for now, we can come back to the question of whether there are other pieces of information and other pieces of research we need to do. I just wanted to show that these are these are the ones that I currently have on my radar. Maybe I should just pause right there and say, do these sound right? Do any of these sound unnecessary? Is there anything that immediately comes to mind that we should add in? Um, I, I really like uh, what you've got mapped out there for September 23rd. Um, I, I, I do think after Ollie's presentation today that um, we probably need uh, a more in-depth discussion about how, um, how one taxing jurisdiction's decisions can sort of overwhelm the decisions and needs of others. And I think that's why all of us are here. And I think it probably bears some additional discussions. I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what the most effective way to, to do that is, but I, I think this, what he um, presented, and again, we've been talking about it, but it was particularly graphic this time, uh, how that phase-in period really had a disproportionate uh, impact on, on other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that on October 7th, I think in many ways, with this board, um, this board and some of the other boards in the two towns are entering, a, appear to be entering a, a new era of conversation among themselves, which is a good thing. Uh, but I think it's probably worth uh, a more in-depth discussion on that on October 7th. reactions to, to this list? Uh, more of a question, yeah. Jeff, and that is um, how firm will the long-term facilities plan actually be? Will the, the board have had a chance <laughs> to make decisions, or is this just going to be, we will get the presentation that the board will have done? You'll get the presentation that the board will have done. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be looking at two concepts in terms of the facility plans. They won't be making any decisions. It's their first time they see it. The two concepts are really sort of, uh, sort of extreme. And so we're going to look for what questions or additional questions they may have. We're also going to be bringing to the board some of the work that came from the full committee of possible uh, considerations for the pool. Um, so no decisions are being made. It's really about their first view of, of any of the work that has been done by uh, the committees and uh, to gather information want them to see it, and what we want to know from them is um, any questions that they may have in order to help make a decision. Just my agenda, don't worry about it, I'm right now. <laughs> um, okay, great question, yeah, yeah. You know, I think about that as um, anytime you're making decisions, there are some major things that are always in flux, and, and this is going to be one of them as we come to recommendations towards the end of November, not to know, but having it as a parameter, you know, parameters will be, I think, very helpful. So, okay, Todd, we can move on to the, the next piece. 
so in this piece, I was just starting to think about the question, all right, how are we going to actually do this work, and what are the tasks that need to be done? And, um, uh, and I see, you know, I came up with these four, and very much you know, want your reaction. The first is just planning all those sessions for the next two meetings, right? Uh, and I've already been in conversation with different people, David and Penny, for instance, have been helping me think about the business, you know, the impact on business piece and other conversations with other of you. Um, but so that's, you know, whether it's a task or a working group or whatever, that's, that's one piece. The, the second is this, this question of the long-term projections and, and uh, getting our base model to a place that we're, that we're comfortable before we start talking about shifting, you know, what levers we're going to uh, talk about shifting, we, we need to take this, um, this piece of the variance and make sure that we uh, have, and, and you know, it, that may be, rather than just using a single projection, it may be talking about, a, you know, best, worst, most likely, uh, so that we can, you know, help, help us across some of these major drivers. That's why I think that this, question, this discussion of variance and major drivers really is so important. And then I really see that there are two, two issues. One is, you know, what, what would a long-term policy parameters look like on the three things we're being asked for, uh, sort of in a steady state? Um, and, and then, the, and then the, so the short to medium term scenario is uh, if we do determine um, that the, you know, the fund balance in particular is, uh, uh, is, is higher than, than we would recommend, um, how would we recommend bringing it down, moving to a more you know, steady state? So I see those as, as two different conversations. Um, so again, let me pause there. The, the, the next thing I'm going to do is um, is talk about what I think the levers are and what I think the sort of key elements of the guidelines could be for uh, five or ten minutes. But before we do that, just any, get any reactions to these as the main kind of tasks. David. So we're going to do this as um, let's just pass these around. The next two pages um, I've actually printed out for you, um, so that you can work on them. So Todd, can you go ahead and go up to the to the next page? So I I, I call this developing guideline options. Just be beginning to ask, you know, from the beginning I've said, you know, what 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 will we actually recommend? What you know, what, what are the pieces of it going to be? Um, and so I, I've now tried to put them down. In one place, I, I, I or one we have one extra thing. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm. I don't intend this to be in any way a recommendation um, of, of any particular decisions, or even a recommendation that any of these levers are things that we should use. They're just all the pieces that I've heard, and so I just wanted to gather them in one place so that we can begin to talk about what we should be working on. So, and again, I put the committee goals at the top of this page just so that when we're <laughs> talking about it, we can keep referring back to that. Um, uh, so, I, I've talked about uh, the first is potential guideline elements, and that is, um, you know, in terms of policy recommendations, what, what we might we be talking about? One is just the fund balance itself. Um, uh, Todd, I can't remember. Do we have a lower limit in our current? I, you know, lots of places say if you go below X percent. Um, I can't even remember if we even have a lower limit in the current policy. Do you remember? Do you remember? I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think we do. So, um, so the questions of lower limits and upper limits, uh, we've been actually looking for uh, communities, for, for districts that have an upper limit. Um, we have so far found two. Um, one of them is Barrington, Barrington right, and the other, and the other is District 97, who just passed the policy, um, which I think was because of us that we did. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, do we do we in fact put an upper limit in? We'll have to have a discussion about that, um, and if so, what would it look like? Uh, and um, would there be contingency carve outs? Barrington, in fact, has an upper limit, but then says plus any reserves that the board creates. Um, so, uh, 
and then and then the question of what you you know how you would talk about it if you did uh, if you were above an upper limit. So that's on the fundamental policy. On the structural, what I call the structural deficit here. Um, uh, one ways we might think about creating a policy is to talk about in, in sort of broad terms. Uh, if we can't, you know, everybody says you can't live within CPI in the school over the, over the long haul. I think that's been the experience across the state. Uh, but you might ask the question, what can you live within? And is it CPI plus something that you can sort of target? Uh, and so that, that, that's one that I think we could discuss. Um, and then the other things that, you know, are interested in the policy are targeting some time frame between referendums uh, and, and or rate increases. You know, I always show you, you have these these big jumps when you do a referendum. Um, would you think about saying, well, we want to we want to smooth it out in some ways, so we don't want the jump to be too big, and, and would that be part of the policy? So those are the things in sort of the pure policy world that I've identified so far. And then in the next piece, I'll talk we'll talk about the variables, which is similar to what we've been calling levers, things that we can actually control. Uh, I, I think these are all things we can control. We'll see if I have that right or not. Um, so one is the levy itself, uh, and you know the options are uh, the the you know what, what uh, we've been calling the, the standard or the common practice or the um, or just the assumption that you take the full CPI increase as the maximum increase. Um, you could do a partial. Um, you could freeze it as District 90 did last year. Um, you could reduce it, uh, and, and in fact, I have separated out debt here. And um, for District 200 last year, Ollie showed it as a as a um, as a reduction. It was in fact a, a maximum increase in the operating levy combined with an abatement of debt service um, that that ended up bringing the total. But so those are the levy choices. Um, and then debt is another one we have some uh, control over. Um, still still waiting to see this year. The, the, our, our total debt is somewhere in the 16 to $18 million range right now. Um, I'm fascinated having you know, grown up in the private sector um, that uh, we talk about a fund balance, but we, we don't actually talk about um, uh, the, the debt as part of the bat on, on the balance sheet. You know, we don't talk about a net um, a asset. You just talk about the fund balance. So this $18 million or so of debt, we have some options with. Some of it can be prepaid um, as, as allowed. It can't all be prepaid at once, but some of it could. Um, and we have an option of abating debt service, um, uh, which uh, was over $3 million last year, right, that we abated. Uh, and then there's the whole facilities plan. And, and um, you know, we, so that's one that we both have to understand as a parameter, as you were asking, Peter, but um, also this question of whether it offsets uh, pieces in the, you know, in, in the current projections. Maybe that should be under consideration, but not here. Um, whether, uh, you know, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Chris, we're not, we're not doing um, any cost containment recommendations from this, but the board will have decisions to make about how much to money to devote to that, um, to the facilities plan. And so when I talk about an expense range, I don't expect us to recommend that, but it's something that we should say to the board, uh, you know, if you're here, it has this implication, but you say it has other implications. Uh, we do have control over whether we, we finance any um, long-term capital out of the existing um, fund balance or annual operating uh, and or, or, or do debt financing. So those are uh, that's another piece. Uh, and then in, in, in these overall discussions, I, I, I hear a variety of things. One of them is always special projects. Um, and some of those are pie in the sky, just you know, take a big chunk and fix it, <laughs> um, whatever the it is. And, and others are to say, you know, there may be the development of an educational program that has some one-time costs that you might want to devote some of it to, so we can think about that. Uh, there, there's, um, the question always comes up from at least um, uh, one set of citizens about whether we could refund some of the um, uh, money that has accumulated over the years. Um, there are all sorts of reasons that that would be very difficult to do. Um, 
but but I just wanted to say it and make sure that we at least give it um, you know a, a credible keep that's not a hard one, <laughs> um, maybe a hard one. Uh, and then uh, the idea of intergovernmental loans. I don't know if that's a viable idea or not, but it's been floated by a couple different people um, in private conversations on the committee and others around town that there might be some purposes for working on um, you know, some of the fund balance for that. Uh, so let me do my, my other pitch first and then we can come back and just do general reactions. The, the on, the, on the flip side of what I handed out are what I call additional key considerations. Um, so the first one is this projections, and we've already talked about this a lot to, tonight, the, you know, what are the key drivers, understanding the key drivers and uh, getting comfortable with the best worst and most likely scenario the projections we're working with. Um, the question of the value of retaining taxing capacity. Uh, uh, there's a big issue if we, if we do freeze the operating levy that um, uh, you, um, I, I always try to do this, if, if you were with an example, if you, people have talked about leaving money on the table, if you took a million dollars less um, of uh, tax revenue than you were permitted to in, uh, under current law in a given year, and you were going to assume you were going to go to referendum 10 years later, well, that million dollars, for, that million dollars is foregone for every year going forward, um, uh, essentially, as I, as, I, as I think about this. So um, <coughs> when we think about our levers, that's a, just a piece we have to take into account. Is, that, is it important for us? <coughs> to maintain the, the capacity. Now there's, there's legislation pending that might give us the ability to make that up. It's not likely, but that's one. The other is the value of retaining a borrowing capacity, which currently is very high. Um, we have a lot of capacity. Um, and the importance of a AAA bond rating, which is something we should discuss over time. We, uh, it's been one of the things that we've talked about a lot is, is that we have a AAA bond rating. Um, I always uh, chuckle over great it is to be able to borrow when you don't need to. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I'm not sure we're going to bump up into a situation where we would be <coughs> endangering at all with any of the recommendations we make, but it's just it's just something to keep in mind. Um, not to get it, it, well, How well, tied to that uh, should we be? At yeah. least a, a peek at what the actual outcome of that might be, because I don't think your rate differential is actually a shock. That's right. Like that's right. That's why. Your AAA and your AA. That's why. That's why the question has, has come up. That that um, it, it, you know part of the conservative budgeting is to, has been to maintain that AAA bond rating, or the AAA bond rating has been the, the marker to let you know you were doing a good job, and, right. and just how tied to it should we be. Okay. Triple uh, the AAA three, and the last time it went out, had rates that were below three percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which uh, is only relevant. Rates were if they were triple A. So right, right, right. Right. Um, and, and then the question of debt, we, we have not, um, you know, used a lot of debt recently in the district. Uh, more in the sort of the long term or the steady state question. How how uh, you know what what should our policies be about debt? What have they been and why are things we need to talk about? Um, this question of can we increase our investment income at all? Uh, the answer seems to be not a lot, but it keeps coming up as we look at a blended rate of about uh, a third of a point right now um, uh, on our investments. Um, uh, 2007 isn't returning anytime soon, right? So, uh, um, uh, and then these, uh, the, the question of the smoothness and predictability of taxes, that's related to the question that I asked earlier about how big a jump would you ever want to do in a referendum. And, um, and even retaining taxing rate, right? If, if, if a law did pass that said you could take flat levies for a few years and then make it up, um, making it up would mean a, a, a big jump. Um, and uh, there, there is the predictability for citizens that is important that we want to take into account. And finally, and this um, is, is about you know, balancing major interests. I think that's mostly what we're about. First and foremost, from the school standpoint, there's a quality education for our students. Um, but it's balancing it with the, the tax burden on citizens and it's balancing it with um, different constituencies within the school and within the, within the community as, as well that we just need to keep in mind. 
So that's sort of my big picture, to try to just put us all uh, in some way on the same page. These are the kinds of things that we're ultimately going to be talking about. Um, and so I open the floor for reactions and thoughts and uh, anything anybody has to say. So I think we great first step for a great more than first step. Um, and I agree with most of what you've got here. I guess one of the things, though, that I've been thinking about is, um, like Chris said earlier, like, don't get too deep into the details. You know, we're supposed to stay up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I think about some of the recommendations, if we if we said um, a recommendation would be that the school board adopt best practices in governance for finance and budgeting in a tax cap world, would the would the school know what that is? Would we know what best practices are for a tax cap in a tax cap world? Kind of shaking your head no behind you. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't. I've never seen a book so titled that. <laughs> we couldn't get that general. We couldn't say you have to adapt best. You have to go out and find out what best practices are, and you have to adopt them. I don't think they're out there. I actually think it's our job to um, come up with a hypothesis as to what those best practices are in the context of this school at this time. In this community. <laughs> in this community. Because I think that that best practice might be very different depending upon your behavior available to you. Pardon me? According to your development around you and projected development over the long term. And if you lived outside of Cook County, everything would be so different. So that says we have to get into a little bit of detail. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. But is our goal to get to best practices for this community? To give them give them guidance around best practices for this community, for governance. To at least provide a rationale for how we're reaching the conclusions we're reaching so that over the course of time, as best practices could be uh, better identified. I mean, it sounds like we'll be the ones creating some of the best right. practices. I think that, that we're, we're trying, yeah, trying to tease them out. Yeah. Um, I just want to say something, Judy, about the not getting into the weeds piece, into the details piece. Um, I want to distinguish between not getting into the details of the expenses and cost containment, which is which is the piece that we're not charged with, um, uh, and that there is an ALT and that the school is working on, from getting into the details of, of the, you know, the, 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 the levy and the referendum piece. Now, now that we've always said it's related to, to, to cost, mm -hmm. and we can't ignore it, but um, but the warning or the request not to, to get into the details, I think, has been primarily about cost containment, but, no, but that's not our job. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I just want to say one thing, though. I do think we're going to have to get more into the details around projections. Yeah. Because right. projections are so critical um, to right. forecasting right. and to setting any kind of guidance. Right. Well, that's the Absolutely. Trend. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to throw the time at 9.25 and ask Todd to go back to the slide, or the, the, slide, the page, <laughs> about paths and work groups because it relates directly to that point. Um, and that's the question is, how, you know, if, if this is general, I actually don't want to cut a conversation about this totally. If there's anything else that anybody wants to say about that. Just real quick, I think I perhaps mentioned before is that I think the rationale as to where the targets are coming from is an important part of what we do in terms of detail. Say, you know, you shouldn't go above 5% on something. You want to have that tied to some rationale so as the economy or something else changes, the policy will adopt with it as opposed to just having a target. Um, I don't have a question. So let me go back and talk about this. So let me s start from the bottom because it gets more clear at the bottom. <laughs> um, 
So at the bottom, uh, not, not all the way to the bottom, the bottom of September right. 23rd, um, the, the, our, our debt scheduling terms are, are right. directly right. related to what, what we can do with the letter. Um, the re referendum experience and fund balance policy in other communities is directly related to, to you know, referendum policies, right? So what else have people done? Um, uh, you know, the board has clearly said we, we want to understand if there, if there is anything even resembling best practice or at least experience out there, the board, not us. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 the top three uh, are, are more about context and more about understanding um, the community's interest and balancing um, the, the, the school's interest with the community's interest. Uh, I, I think that um, we got, we've got a lot of that, but we don't quite have all of it. Um, uh, so uh, in, in some sense, if there's a technical piece of this and if there's a small p political piece of understanding the policy, um, mm -hmm. the first three are, are about understanding the, the, the political dynamics a little bit more. Uh, I would like very much to keep those three, those first three all together mm -hmm. um, under 45 minutes to an hour of the next meeting. Okay. Just, it seems like a lot to cover. And I understand those, the first three are the ones I had questions about. Yeah. But understanding that rationale, then I really think that one of our committee goals, and this could be just the fact that I missed the first meeting, but the balance of major interests as an additional key consideration. I think we've got to formulate something that we put in as a goal that directly addresses school stability and citizen tax burdens as the reasons that this committee is here. So that it's more of a, you know, not just uh, the nuts and bolts of, of the fund balance, but also kind of that bigger picture. Yeah. Discourse when you created the well, it was certainly part of the discourse, but not part of the not part of the business. Uh, I mean, I, I can go back and look at what the uh, initial report was that they. You know, in many ways, I've and that happened before we were on the board. So. Uh, potentially under item four of recommended communication strategy, because if you're not articulating the balance and a few other things, it's not a good communication strategy if you're not saying why and what interests it balances. I'm okay with adding something explicit to it, but that would be the board's mm -hmm. discretion. But I think what you're asking for really can come out under the communication goals, and as long as we acknowledge that, I think that might be sufficient. And it may be difficult for us to be able to actually model it out to a point where we're going to be able to incorporate as many objections, but I think the, the reality is that there are um, impacts from the decisions that are being made coming out of this board. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, uh, Jackie, yeah, I'm going to recommend, I'd like to give some thought to, to that recommendation, and whether it's um, including it as a goal or just, um, or, or just, or keep in mind, or even, uh, you know, the only, uh, other than approving minutes and, and um, adjournments, uh, the only other, uh, you know, the, uh, the only other motion that has been made and passed on here was adopting these goals, and it, and it, and it may be that we want to adopt something formally about about this question, um, whether it goes into the goals or, goes or, or just the sense of the committee or, or an understanding of the committee. So I think it's a great point to uh, give it some thought. Yes, please. The why is, is solved is really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, I think Jackie's putting us on board. Okay, I do, I do want to move us. I, I try so hard to end on time, and we're going to go a couple minutes over here. But if we go back to the, the, the um, task group for the following, which way is that? Uh, I think it's the other way. Sorry. Hello? Yeah. There we go. Um, 
So I think on planning the sessions for the next time, um, uh, what I'd like to do is just move forward as I have been and reach out to individual committee members and, and, and uh, get that done. I think the projection analysis, the getting the comfortable with, you know, comfortable with the projections, um, I do, I, I think I really would like to see a couple of committee members, um, preferably at least one committee member, um, uh, maybe working with Todd and, and, and working this through. Um, I haven't really talked this over with Steve and Todd yet. Um, but uh, I, I think we need to start working now on getting that base model to a place that we're all comfortable, that we have the, the three different, or at least two different ranges to, to do. So um, I, I think that maybe Todd, you and I should talk about that offline and then uh, again, if you're uh, if any of you is uh, dying to work on that with us, tell me either now or privately. <laughs> What's our maximum number of people who can be together? Is it um, four or is it it's five? four. I think four. So, uh, 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 and then and then I so so we'll do that. We'll we'll come up with a, 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 a small group to work on that. Um, um, and then I think that at the next meeting we should carve out some time to talk about some of the specifics about the long-term policy parameters and maybe have a small group come out of that meeting to do whatever the next step of research needs to be on that. <coughs> and then the short term, I think, actually comes last. I, I, think we, I think we need to do the long term first. So I see a lot of nodding heads, so this, this, feels, this feels like a relatively comfortable plan. Okay, with that, I'll take one or two more questions or comments and then ask for public comment. I mean, I think that I think that the next I think that the next meeting would primarily be about those three, but you just went to the broader question first. Uh -huh. Okay, let me think about that as I put the agenda together. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, and I think that's true of these and the you know the, the, this sheet that I handed out. We have reflections on this, um, and please feel free to email me questions and comments on these things too. I really do. I do much better if I if I hear those in advance. So if you have reflections. Send them to me by all means. Okay, anything else? Uh, so I will ask if there is any public comment this evening. Ralph, please. I'm Ralph Lee. I live at 333 North Kyler Avenue in Oak Park. And not by coincidence, I'm a sitting member of the District 200 Board. What you have before you is a resolution. I believe that there are only three people in the room who have seen this, that I know for sure have seen this. And that's because this is a resolution that was passed by our board in, I think, the spring of 2008, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the exact date. What I do remember very clearly, though, is that this was passed by a 7-0 vote of our board. First of all, I'd like to ask you to take my word for it and skip over all the whereas's because they don't contain any information that you haven't learned in the, in the last three hours. I'd like to concentrate on one of the four things that the board voted seven to zero to resolve to do. Well, 
we don't have time tonight to talk what to resolve means. I, I, I understand it to mean a good faith promise to do our best to do certain things at one end of the range and with the other end of the range, meaning it don't mean a damn thing. We resolved to do four things. Numbers one and four, I believe our board has done a creditable job of doing. I, I would like to believe that the existence of this committee stemmed at least a tiny bit from the passage of this resolution. The third is one that I think it's still too early to expect our, our district to do, and that is to really get our hands dirty and help to change the state taxing, educational taxing laws. I don't, we, haven't, we haven't accomplished anything there and I don't expect, I, th I don't think it would have been reasonable to expect us to by now. Uh, this is an appeal to the board, uh, uh, an appeal to this committee and I'm making this appeal to this committee because I have reason to believe that the recommendations that are made to the board by this committee will be far more meaningful than most recommendations that have been made to our board, period. I, I have a lot of faith in what can come out of the work that you are doing, and I attach a great deal of importance to that. Number two, that we have resolved to do is something that I don't believe we have even begun to do. And I'm making an appeal to you to try to convince our board to actually start working on this. And that is start working on a method for setting educational priorities in such a way that necessary changes in educational strategies can be managed by changing spending priorities rather than by seeking higher tax revenues. We don't talk about setting educational priorities when we talk about spending. We do not, in my opinion, draw ties between educational priorities and how much money we spend. I think there are a number of reasons for this. The cynical, the more cynical side of me says that if you start talking about priorities, you set yourself up as a target when you start identifying the lower priorities because you know that uh, you're gonna become a target from at least people writing nasty letters because whatever you set as a lower priority, you can be willing to bet that there are some citizens in the community that disagree with you vociferously. But I still think that that's why we get paid the big bucks. I hope that you will be willing to try to convince our board to start developing ways of setting educational priorities in the process of fixing our financial problems, whatever we think they are. I've probably used up my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else? Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Thanks very much, everybody. Good meeting.